So our next speaker is Asmaen Yamin from the CUNY Graduate Center, who will talk about the exceptional automorphism of that sense. Please. Okay. Um, hello. Yes. My yes. name is Ajmain, and uh, the title of my talk is The Exceptional Automorphism of S6 Explained with Colored Maps. So first uh, is the definition of automorphism. So the automorphism group of a group G denoted oh. G is the set of all automorphisms of G under the operation of composition. An automorphism phi it, of G is inner if it is <clears throat> if it is conjugation by an element of G. Otherwise, it is outer. So the inner automorphisms forms a normal subgroup of the automorphism group of G, and this is because phi after an inner automorphism composed with uh, the inverse of phi is still an inner automorphism. Okay. Um. Now, the group G mod the inner automorphisms is called the outer automorphism group of G and is denoted out G. So in this talk, we are concerned with automorphism groups of symmetric groups. And uh, first, we have a definition. A group is complete if it's centerless and all the automorphisms are inner. So in this case, um, since G mod the center is isomorphic to the inner automorphism group, we see that the automorphism group of G is isomorphic to G uh, for complete groups. And then we have a theorem that says that if N is not two or six, then S N is complete. And for the symmetric group on two letters, the center is just the whole group. Uh, since it's commutative, so S2 cannot be complete. And both the automorphism group of S2 and the outer automorphism group of S2 are trivial. So S2 is uh, a special case because it's just Zima 2 z And fr from this theorem, uh, we get that the automorphism group of Sn is isomorphic to Sn for n not equal to 2 and 6 because of the first that this remark here says for a complete uh, group, the automorphism group of a complete group is isomorphic to itself. And uh, for n not equal to two and six, Sn is complete. And um, the outer automorphism group of Sn is trivial for n not equal to six. Um, we remarked here that the outer automorphism group of S2 is trivial. Okay. And um, the outer automorphism group of Sn for n not equal to two or six is also trivial um, because those Sn's are complete. So to prove that uh, Sn is complete for n not equal to 2 and 6, um, we use this lemma. Uh, so none of this is uh, my work. Uh, this is very classical. This is from a textbook by, um, um, forgetting the author. But I'm just uh, presenting the, uh, the proofs here. So the lemma is. Uh, the center of Sn is trivial for n greater than or equal to 3. And an automorphism of Sn preserves transposition, transpositions if and only if it's inner. So assume that n is greater than or equal to 3. We already took care of the case n equals 2. Um, by, lemma, by this lemma, to show that Sn is complete, it suffices to prove that any automorphism of Sn preserves transpositions. Um, we already know that the center is trivial. So that's one part of completeness, the center is trivial. And the other part is that all automorphisms are inner. That would mean that the outer automorphism group is trivial. Okay, so why are all automorphisms inner? It's because of this lemma that says that an automorphism of Sn preserves transpositions if and only if it's inner. 
So we just need to show that um, every automorphism of Sn uh, preserves transpositions. So let Tk denote the conjugacy class of Sn of all products of k disjoint transpositions. For any automorphism of Sn, we know that it sends a order two l a a order two element to an order two element, which is one of these con which is in one of these conjugacy classes. So it must send the conjugacy class of uh, transpositions to uh, one of these pks, and then um, we can show that if n doesn't equal six, then the size of the conjugacy class of transpositions is not equal to the size of the conjugacy class of TK for K not equal to one. So you just write down the formula. Well, you, you write down a formula for the size of these conjugacy classes, and then uh, they're not equal uh, unless uh, N equals six. In this case, um, uh, the only place that T1 can get mapped to is T1 itself. So then uh, phi or theta sends transpositions to transpositions. And so theta is inner and the outer, outer automorphism group of Sn is trivial for these cases. Okay, so now we saw that every outer automorphism group of Sn is trivial, except for the case n equals six. Um, and this was because of this we needed uh, an equality here, but okay. I didn't write down the numbers, but that's the, the argument. Okay. And in 1895, uh, a holder says that there exists an exceptional automorphism of S6. And in fact, the outer automorphism group of Sn is trivial for n not equal to six. We already saw that. But the outer automorphism group of Sn is isomorphic to Zima 2Z for uh, n equals six. Um, so once you know there exists an exceptional automorphism of S6, how do you show that um, there aren't any more? Um, the proof of that is here. So this is the proof of the essential uniqueness of an outer automorphism of S6. So any automorphism theta of S6 permutes the conjugacy classes of S6. From this lemma above, theta is inner. Uh, the lemma I'm referring to is this one, which says that an automorphism of Sn preserves transpositions if and only if it's inner. So theta is inner if and only if theta of T1 is equal to T1 where TK denotes the conjugacy class of all products of K disjoint transpositions. And then um, by this table, which lists out all of the conjugacy classes in SN, um, we see uh, here C2 is the one that is labeled T1 here. It's the conjugacy class of transpositions, and that has 15 elements. And then the only other conjugacy class that also has 15 elements is C10 which is a product of three disjoint transpositions. So that's the only one that also has 15 elements. So this means that if you are a uh, automorphism of S6, then um, you are outer if and only if you interchange T1 with T3, the conjugate class of one transposition and the conjugate class of uh, three disjoint transpositions uh, multiplied together. So it follows that if phi, if theta and psi are outer, then theta after psi is inner, because uh, if you transpose these two conjugate classes twice, you get the identity. So that leaves the conjugate class of transpositions unchanged. So uh, this composition is inner. And so the outer automorphism group of S6 is Zima 2Z. So, um, or at most Zima 2Z. So once you know that there is, is an exceptional automorphism of S6, it's uh, unique uh, up to inner automorphisms. Okay. 
So now how do we construct an outer automorphism of S6? So the technique is usually to construct an exotic embedding of S5 into S6. And I'll say what that means in the next slide. And then uh, you'll form the set Y of left cosets of the image of this embedding inside of S6. And since S5 has order five factorial and six has order six factorial, the set of left cosets is going to be six because that's the index. And then let S6 act by left multiplication on itself in turn permuting the cosets collected in Y. So Y is the set of coset, left cosets of K, which is the image of S5 inside of S6. And then these cosets are going to be permuted amongst each other by left multiplication from S6. And so this gives us a homomorphism from S6 to the permutations of Y. And since Y consists of six elements, the permutations of Y is isomorphic to S6. So that's the homomorphism from S6 to S6. And the claim is that this is an outer automorphism of S6. OK, so what is this exotic embedding? An exotic embedding is an injective homomorphism from S5 to S6, such that the image acts transitively on the letters 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. So the obvious embeddings S5 into S6 aren't exotic as they fix a letter. For example, if you just let S5 act on the first five elements, that's not going to that's not going to um, send something to six, or it's going to fix six. So that's not going to be an exotic embedding. You need to be a the image needs to be uh, acting transitively on these six elements. Okay, so here's the lemma: the image of an exotic embedding contains no transpositions. Um, so the proof is over here, but maybe I'll just skip uh, for time. Um, and the reason we need this lemma is to prove uh, that phi uh, or theta, the one that was in the outline, uh, is an outer automorphism of S6. So again, let K be the image of an exotic embedding S5 into S6. Let Y be the set of six left cosets of K in S6, and let theta be uh, the map, the homomorphism from S6 to S6, uh, induced from the action of S6 acting by left multiplication on itself. So when S6 acts on itself by left multiplication, it permutes the cosets of K inside of S6, and that's a six element set, so that's uh, identified with S6. So why is this an outer automorphism of S6? Well, first, um, theta is injective because K contains the kernel. So why, why is K contained in the kernel? Well, you need to fix. Uh, OK. Uh, let's just keep going. So K it contains the kernel, but this is too small to contain a6. Uh, so k is isomorphic to s5, which has order uh, 5 factorial, but a6 is larger than uh, 5 factorial. So you can't contain this normal subgroup, but the only uh, smaller normal subgroup is the, is the identity. So that means k is trivial. So that means uh, theta is injective, and so it's surjective, and so it's an automorphism of s6. And now, we want to show that it's outer automorphism. So suppose it's inner. So if it's inner, then it sends transpositions to transpositions. In particular, it sends a transposition 1, 2 to a transposition of the six element set Y. So this, uh, this, uh, this permutation of Y, theta 1, 2, is going to just swap two elements in Y. In particular, it's going to fix four elements in Y. So there has to be some coset alpha K in Y, which is fixed by the action of left multiplication by one, two. So there has to be some uh, alpha K such that one, two times alpha K is equal to alpha K. 
But then we get that alpha inverse one, two, alpha is in K, just multiplied by alpha inverse on both sides. And this contradicts the previous lemma, which says that the image of an exotic embedding contains no transpositions because uh, the conjugate of a transposition is still a transposition. So this is how we prove that uh, this is an outer automorphism of S6. And now, finally, we just need to construct an exotic embedding. So uh, the way, the typical way to construct an exotic embedding of S5 into S6 is by considering uh, Silo 5 subgroups. This is not the only way, but this is uh, the typical way um, in most textbooks. So let P be the set of all Silo 5 subgroups of S5. So P consists of order five cyclic subgroups generated by five cycles. There are six such subgroups all conjugate to each other um, by the Silo theorems. S5 acts by conjugation on itself, permuting the six subgroups collected in P transitively. This induces an, a homomorphism from S5 to the permutations of this set of six Silo subgroups. Uh, this collection of Silo subgroups, which is a six element collection, right? Who's, and this, the image of this homomorphism acts transitively on P. The kernel of this homomorphism has size at most the order of the group that's acting divided by the size of the space that it's acting on. So that's five factorial over six, since P is a transitive S5 set. And this kernel is too small to contain A5, so it has to be trivial, the same argument. This A5 has order five factorial over two, which is bigger than five factorial over six. So, so the kernel has to be trivial. So this is an injective homomorphism. So this is an, ex exotic embedding. It's an injective homomorphism, which also acts transitively on uh, the six element set. So this is an example of an exotic embedding. And uh, the point of my talk is to have an exotic embedding uh, that's obtained from map coloring. So what is a map? A map is a embedding of a graph into a surface such that the complement of the image is a disjoint union of topological disks. And the connected components of the complements are called faces of the map. So for example, uh, the tetrahedron is a map and the underlying graph is K4, the complete graph on four elements. And the underlying surface is sigma one, sigma zero, the sphere. So K4 gets embedded inside of the sphere and those become the vertices and edges of the tetrahedron. And then the faces of the map are just the triangular faces of the tetrahedron. So, the, so you can, I hope it's clear that this is K4 embedded inside of the sphere. Okay, so the notation Kn is for complete graph and sigma G is for compact connected oriented surface of the genus G. And the tetrahedron is a map K4 embedded inside of sigma zero. And that's the definition of a map. So the map we are going to use is this five-faced map on the torus, K5 embedded inside of sigma one. So sigma one is the torus and K5 is a complete graph on five vertices. So here you see the vertices are these four valent vertices, one, two, three, four, and five. There are five vertices and every vertex is adjacent to every other vertex. You can uh, look on this uh, map. Uh, so in particular, this center vertex is adjacent to these four vertices next to it. And so is this one. This one here is adjacent to the center vertex. And then going up, it's adjacent to this. Going left, it's adjacent to this. And going uh, bottom left, it's adjacent to this. So those are so every vertex is adjacent to every other vertex. So that's an embedding of the complete graph and five vertices into this torus. And here's another description of the same five-faced map on a torus using Gaussian integers. So we can consider the square lattice Z adjoint I inside of the complex plane 
known as the Gaussian integers, and then consider the index five ideal two plus i inside of the Gaussian integers. It has index five, since five is equal to two squared plus one squared. And then consider the torus C mod two plus i. So two plus i is a square lattice inside of the complex plane. And then C mod this two plus i is a uh, square torus. And then Z mod i is a set so, okay, I, I should have wrote Z mod Z adjoint I mod two plus I is a set of five points in the torus. So the equivalence classes of this Gaussian integers when you mod out by two plus I, that's a set of five points in, in this torus and they will be the vertices of our map and the edges will be the shortest Euclidean geodesics connecting each pair of vertices in this torus. So here's a picture. Um, this is the complex plane the blue points are the Gaussian integers, and then the black points are the, uh, no, the blue points are the points in the ideal two plus I, and the black points are in the Gaussian integers, and then these red lines are the edges of the map. And uh, that's the same map as this one, uh, as a map. Okay, so now um, we need to get to colored maps. So. A colored map is just a map where you assign colors to every face. So um, I have a five element set C, and this is a set of distinct colors. And then the coloring of this map is going to be a bijection from C to the five faces of M, right? This has five faces. You can count the five distinct uh, colors in this picture. OK, so the question first is, how many colorings of M are there? And there are five factorial because there are five factorial bijections from a five element set to a five element set. Just the five permutations. And now uh, to make this more interesting, we say an oriented automorphism of a map is a cell homeomorphism of the underlying surface, which sends vertices to vertices, edges to edges, and faces to faces. And uh, now if I ask the question, how many colorings of the Five, five face map on the torus that I described earlier. Are there up to oriented automorphisms? Uh, the number reduces drastically. So it's five factorial, this becomes a lot smaller. So uh, the same, so I'm not answering the question yet. Um, this, is a, this is another way to say the question. If I have five color tiles, how many ways can I glue the edges together to make a map? a five colored map on the torus. And I consider two maps to be the same if they have the same, uh, if I can do some automorphism, oriented automorphism on one map to make the colorings on one match up with the colorings on another. Okay, so what are the oriented automorphisms of this K5 embedded in this torus? Well, oriented automorphisms of this map lift to affine linear transformations of the universal cover. C, which preserve the integer, the square lattice, the adjoint I. So for example, this is an example of an automorphism of this map. And below I have uh, the set of five tiles. And um, above I have their universal cover by C. And I just did a rotation, a 90 degree rotation to get from uh, the, the one on the top left to the one on the top right. And um, when I project back down, this is what happens to the colors, right? So, um, so these two colorings are actually the same up to oriented uh, automorphisms. So you see here, uh, and from this picture, it's clear that uh, given any coloring of this, map, five-faced map on the torus, I can do some oriented automorphism to make it so that the red is at the center and the blue is right next to the red. So uh, this is an example that I did over here. And so that means that there are six colored maps uh, that you get from five tiles. So you just make the center one red and the one next to it blue. And now you have uh, three free tiles to choose three colors. So there are three factorial 
uh, such uh, ways to color this five-faced map on the torus, which is uh, and three factorial is six. So these are the six colorings. And now, how, this is my last slide. Uh, how do I get the exotic embedding? Oops. Yeah. How do I get the exotic embedding uh, of S5 into S6 via colored maps? Well, there are six colorings of the map, uh, this five-faced map on the torus. A permutation of the five colors induces a permutations of these, a permutation of these six colored maps. And my claim is that this is an exotic embedding of S6 into S, S5 into S6. So it's transitive, clearly, because I can make one coloring into another coloring just by switching the colors however I want. And then it's injective by the same argument as in the Silo 5 subgroup uh, argument, because it's injective because it's transitive. And then, OK. Thank you. Thank you, Edmund. Uh, are there any questions for our speaker? Uh, so what you did, was this in some sense, uh, some way uh, related to or inspired by uh, Grothendieck's uh, Des Hommes d'Enfants? Well, I don't think so. Um, it's just a, I think this is just combinatorial uh, and uh, just, just a combinatorial fact, right? And uh, what I talked about last fall in the New York number theory seminar was about getting an affine model for the design, uh, bipartification design from, of this five colored map on the, on the torus, right? So uh, my interest started from topological graph theory. I like these, these maps, these complete regular maps and uh, one question I asked about it was getting the affine models. And this is another way I uh, played around with these maps, you know, like, yeah. And I'm also, I'm trying to remember, did you give a talk in this conference many years ago when you were still in high school? Yeah, yes, that was on, Multi-dimensional Calc and Wolf tree. Yeah. All right. I uh, thank the speaker again for a very nice talk. And uh, our next talk will be in about three minutes. <laughs>